Okay, first step is making sure everybody can hear me. All right, it's great to be here, especially to be the inaugural speaker, and I'm sure what's going to be a great series. I've looked at some of the people you have coming in here in the, the next few iterations, and it's just a great pleasure to be here. It's good to see some of my former students from Fort Leavenworth here. I see two of them here in the audience. I'm not sure if that the fact that it's just two is a good sign or not, um, but it, it is good to see them. It's good to be here. Good to give this inaugural uh, uh, lecture. And I figured I'd start out by talking a little bit about history and the value and interest of history, uh, because that's what we're all about, right? That's at least what I'm about. That's my job. Um, so quotes, when asked, you know, what would he advise someone who wants to follow in his footsteps, not necessarily in being defeated ultimately by Wellington, but all the good stuff he does before that. Napoleon says, if I could give advice to uh, people who are interested in what I've done and give them guidance, the one thing I would tell them to do is to read history. As he says, read and meditate on history. It's the only real philosophy. And here you have a, a great painting of Napoleon, 1798, when he's in Egypt visiting the Sphinx, getting in touch with history. And from there, well, we all know Napoleon has a very, very good run. Not permanently good run, but it's good for a while, right? Uh, and of course, since then, many, many officers have testified to the value of history in, in guiding and making them successful and effective. Harry Truman um, wrote in his memoirs that history was not just a romantic adventure to him. It was practical instruction and it guided him, and nobody ever loses by reading history. George Patton, once said, to be a success, put it bluntly, to be a successful soldier, you must know history. It is the foundation of military knowledge, of doctrine, of theory. Uh, and of course, recently, the current, someone who's of some importance to the military profession today, has offered his own words on history. Uh, General Dempsey, to understand the profession, you must understand its history. To be able to articulate, provide strategic advice, Leaders must know their history. And, also, and finally, Paul Van Ripper, a Lieutenant General in the Marine Corps, uh, didn't want to just stick with Army stuff. This is where the jointness takes place, right? So I wanted to bring in another service here. Here is a General Ripper. Great quote. A properly schooled soldier never arrives on a battlefield for the first time if he has studied history and studied the past. Because even though history, it's said sometimes that history, inaccurate history repeats itself, it doesn't. But there are echoes, there are parallels that can inform your thinking about situations. And no officer, says Ripper, should ever go on a battlefield for the first time. Even if it's his first time there physically, if you studied history, he's has, he will equip himself with the mental, mental um, qualities necessary to be effective when he arrives on that battlefield. And some, I'll, I'll be talking today a bit about the war in Missouri in 1861. Um, a little bit more study of that would have made some of the more recent battlefields, I think, a little less unfamiliar when the United States military arrived on it. But here we go. The war opens April 1861 with the Battle of Fort Sumter. Um, in this situation, as many of you have studied your history, the first battle of the Civil War, the ironic first battle of the Civil War, in which nobody is wounded or injured except for the two guys at the end when they misload the cannon when they're trying to fire the salute to the United States flag at the end. Uh, this is the beginning of what we, the, formerly the Civil War. Uh, but the Civil War, I, I, I'm not as enthralled with the, con the concept of the Civil War. It starts in 18, 1861, ends in April 1865. There's a very, very neat uh, study of the Civil War in and of those four years. Because the Civil War, the way I think of it is simply the most intense phase of the longer sectional conflict um, that begins from almost the founding of the Republic, the tensions between southern and northern states, and echoes of which still can inform some of our modern politics, this conflict between blue states, red states. Uh, and of course, the Civil War, the fighting between North and South does not end in April 1865. You also have the phase of Reconstruction, and you continue to have these conflicts between the sections continuing on deep into the 20th century. And of course, in the 1960s, we have the Civil Rights Movement, which some have called the Second Reconstruction. Uh, and some have noted the parallels. You know, in the 1860s, a Republican president sent military forces into the South, 
in Arkansas. And in the 1860s, it was a Republican president sending troops into the South as well. Uh, but still, for purposes of what I'm going to talk about today, if I'm going to do the whole sectional conflict today, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to focus on the first few months. And here is as good a point to start. April 1861, we have the Battle of Fort Sumter. Uh, tension between uh, Abraham Lincoln's elected in November. You have several months of tension. Reconstruction, whoops. Reconstruction actually begins in 1860 when South Carolina secedes because what Reconstruction and the war are is continuing the effort to try to find the mix of carrots and sticks that will bring southern states back into their quote-unquote proper relationship to the Union. And what Fort Sumter resolves is that there is going to be a war to do this, that political compromise and efforts to try to settle it peacefully are not going to uh, resolve the sectional conflict. And so on the 15th of April, 1861, Abraham Lincoln issues his call for troops right after Fort Sumter. And in doing so, he defines the problem here. Traditionally, the Civil War itself, the focus is on the battles, right? The battles, the campaigns, the military leaders, the conventional contest, you know, how they maneuvered for important parts of terrain, how they maneuvered to the battlefield. And I'll talk about that with First Manassas, okay? But the way the war is defined by Lincoln here is almost the term police action was used during the Korean War. And that also ultimately is, in some sense, that's how Lincoln is defining the problem. The problem is not secession, because according to Lincoln, secession cannot take place. It is unconstitutional. What has simply happened, and is in southern states, there have been combinations too powerful to be suppressed in the course of judicial proceedings. Yeah, he's a lawyer, right? That kind of lawyer talk. And he am calling out 75,000 troops to suppress combinations and to cause the laws to be duly executed. Okay? So he's trying to find the problem, not as a war between two independent states, because from Lincoln's perspective, secession's illegitimate, and what he calls the so-called Confederacy does not really exist. It's a legal fiction. Uh, but he's got to figure out what he's going to do, and so looks for guidance. How, what, how do we deal with military problems? Of course, in the early 19th century, a guy by the name of Baron Antoine Jomini wrote down, I know some of you who are at CGSC are saying, my God, we're going to go back through Jomini and Clausewitz again. Well, you know, you do go with what you know, okay? Uh, making strategy. How do we make our plans? How do we approach military problems? Um, and Jomini lays out a process for doing that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps. Actually, eight steps, but you know, my math, I'm, I'm a history major, not a math major, okay? And again, first step is agree with your head of state on the character of the war you're involved in. What is this? Is this an interstate conflict? Is it a rebellion? Is it enforcing the law? What is it? Okay, and so Jomini provides us a way of framing the way we think about conflict. Of course, the way the character of the war is defined by the two presidents, to a extent, there's a certain agreement. This is a war, a people's contest, hence the title of the lecture today. Uh, Lincoln says this is a people's contest. Governments rest on the consent of the governed. Everybody agrees this in America in the mid-19th century. It's the war language of the Declaration of Independence. Government legitimacy rests on the consent of the governed. The northern war effort, the war for the Union, has legitimacy because it rests on the consent of the governed. Jefferson Davis uses roughly the same language, borrows language from the Declaration of Independence, consent of the governed, all we ask is you let alone. Of course, the question is, well, consent of the governed. Who are the governed, and what comprises consent? Do you need active consent, passive consent? What and how, does, how do military forces fit into the equation of gaining consent. Because sometimes when you use military force, it can contradict, you can it can hurt your efforts to gain consent of the people. Sometimes you don't use enough military force, that also undermines your ability to gain consent of the governed. So it's a very complicated problem as Lincoln and Davis are defining it. And few places this can be more confusing than in Missouri. And again, by consent of the governed, what they're talking about here, John Shy, who is a historian who's written about the American Revolution, 
um, said the way to think about these conflicts is to think about the triangularity of the struggle. The Federal Army, the Confederate Army, people who support the Confederate Army, people who support the Union Army, they're clearly, you know where their consent is, you know where their perspective is. Um, but oftentimes in these conflicts, these wars of opinion, you've got a great middle apathetic mass that is neither passionate about either side. And the question is, how can we use military force in the process of the northern armies engaging the southern armies? How do we win back consent of one faction of the population without compromising our ability to maintain support from another faction? And what about that great unaligned? What do we want? What are the ways and means to get it? Now, recent, this can be a complicated problem, can it not? I mean, if you're in a situation, I mean, here we go. You've all seen this slide. This is a famous slide, isn't it? I'm a, I teach for the Army, so PowerPoint, you know, i got to get a PowerPoint slide in here like this, right? You look at a map, and this has re received a lot of attention a while back, you know, for showing, you know, how PowerPoint was out of control and it's supposed to clarify and make things clear, and it can do just the opposite. But sometimes the problem isn't clear, okay? Sometimes the problem isn't clear. And if you, you could have, in the Civil War, and again, on the surface, conventional war, Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, conventional conflict, but in many ways, you could draw a slide like this for the American Civil War. You've got the issue of coalition capacity and priorities. The Union war effort, okay? Coalition, the Union war, keep in mind, the Union war effort is a cooperative partnership between the states and the federal government. States have, they are, the military forces are raised by the states, and governors expect to have a say in how their forces are going to be used and who's going to command them and things like that. So there is an element of coalition warfare, your capacities, your ability to work together. And sometimes the governor of Illinois has different priorities or perspectives on priorities from the governor of New York. One looks at the Mississippi River as more important. Another looks at Virginia as more important. So you've got this coalition warfare dynamic in the Civil War. Domestic support. It's a, it's a people's contest. It's not just a war for the hearts and minds of the South, but the people of the North have got to have the will to persist in this conflict. And they get the opportunity to express their sentiments in elections. Tribal governance. The South is a very, very localistic society. Okay, local elites are local elites. Effectiveness of governance, winning sympathy, getting certain sections of the south of southern, in the, for example, the eastern sections of Tennessee, the quote unquote tribal authorities are loyal to the Union. In eastern Tennessee, the local leaders are hostile to the Union. You've got to figure out ways to work with those kinds of people. Population conditions and beliefs, infrastructure services in the economy, you get into the south, thing you want to do is get the economy going again because the southern economy is not working. You're going to have a hard time convincing the people there to return to the Union. Insurgents outside support. Will Britain support the Confederacy? Will France support the Confederacy? Mexico? These dynamics are at work here. Narcotics? Well, maybe not so much narcotics, but if you think as cotton and having the same analogous relationship in terms of it is such a big dominant part of the economy, there are analogies, and granted, these analogies are imperfect, but just to underscore the fact that the Civil War is a very, very complicated um, subject. And a few places illustrate that better than the situation in Missouri, the part of the country where I come from, I come to you from. The situation in Missouri, the consent of the government, the population, how do we win hearts and minds in there? Where are the hearts and minds? How do, who supports us? Who's against us? Well, in November 1860, very conveniently, the people went to the polls and roughly laid out their political sympathies. People who are sympathetic, going to be very sympathetic to the Union cause, well, you can figure out that's 10.28% of the population. Okay? People who are not going to be very friendly to the Union cause and are going to support more states' rights approach, well, you can estimate 18.9%. They supported John C. Breckinridge. The other two candidates, Stephen Douglas and John Bell, presented more of a compromise, reconciliation, let's calm things down perspective. And 70% of the population voted for them, which tells you 
What do the people of Missouri want? Well, we know what 10%, 18%, 30 And how do you come up with a single policy that can satisfy a critical mass of this population? And also keep in mind, that 70%, what do they want? Probably just to be left alone, OK? They just want to be left alone. You remember the, 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 uh, the idea of John Adams' quote on the American Revolution? It was one-third support of the rebellion, one-third support of the, the, the crown, one-third was neutral, and one-third just was, you know, would put up a finger, which way is it going this way, which way is it and, and the question of how do you deal with the apathetic people? Can you just leave them alone? Do you say to them, hey, you can stay out of this when the two things you expect people to provide in the 19th century are pay your taxes and provide some kind of military service. Okay, you go to the apathetic, and they say, we're apathetic, we're not going to pay any taxes. That's pretty sweet for them, right? They don't got to pay taxes to either Confederates or the Federals, right? Of course, if you're the Federals, you're going to expect someone to pay their taxes. Confederates, you can expect someone to pay their taxes. They could try to pay taxes to both sides, but then you tick side both sides up. I mean, it's a very complicated situation here. But based on this voting, the ultimate overwhelming sentiment of the people in Missouri is to just leave us be. If the North and the South are going to fight, leave us out of it. And what happens in 1860-61 is in Missouri, they, begin, they hold a secession convention like all the other states. And essentially what happens is they have the convention. This individual up here, Sterling Price, is the presides over it. And in the convention, they vote to do nothing. Neither embrace the union and support the union, or although they're still technically in the Union, or to join the Confederacy. And it breaks up. And this is a triumph for the policy of William Harney, who is the military commander in St. Louis at the time. Who you imagine is watching this situation pretty closely because there is a major arsenal in St. Louis and is as vulnerable as Fort Sumter is in South Carolina. You know, for the people of St. Louis, the arsenal is the Fort Sumter for them what Fort Sumter is for, for, for uh, Charleston. And Harney's policy is simply to stay out of it, not do anything provocative, and let the, pro let the apathetic majority figure out that they want to stay apathetic. And that is satisfactory for, um, for Harney. However, there's an old saying, revolutions and great events are not driven by apathetic, my, apathetic majorities. They're driven by determined majority, minorities who seize opportunities, and you have some determined minorities in Missouri. They're led by Francis P. Blair, who is a congressman from St. Louis, and he finds a supporter in a young army captain by the name of Nathaniel Lyon. And for them, for Missouri simply to say, we want to stay out of it, is unsatisfactory. What they demand is that Missouri submit to the authority of the Union, unconditionally. And they get really, really nervous when, when Lincoln calls for troops, but Governor Missouri refuses to comply with the request. And that is Governor uh, Claiborne Fox Jackson, who's up there in the upper right-hand corner. Fox Jackson refuses to contribute troops to the effort and writes a very belligerent letter to Lincoln, making clear that he does not believe in this at all. Now, to Blair and Lyon, the state authorities are supposed to submit. This is unsatisfactory. So they maneuver to get Harney removed from power, and then they call together Claiborne Fox Jackson, who has begun raising troops, the Missouri State Guard, under the command of Sterling Price for the purpose of defending Missouri. Of course, the question is defending Missouri against who? And for Lyon and Blair, if Missouri is not raising troops for the federal government, but they're raising troops for another purpose, that is clearly unsatisfactory. Okay, they're raising the militia for some reason. So what they do is they seize and capture a camp called Camp Jackson in which the Missouri State Guard is assembling. They lead their captives through the, uh, city, the streets of St. Louis, and there is a riot in the streets of St. Louis. And things get very, very tense. Uh, there's an effort to calm things down. Uh, but eventually, 
in June, Lyon, Blair are going to meet with Price and Jackson in a place called the Planner's House in St. Louis. And Lyon is going to make clear, we will accept nothing less than complete submission to the authority of the federal government by you guys. And if not, he says, this means war. He says, before I will allow a state to dictate to the federal government what it can and cannot do, I would see every single man, woman in the state of Missouri dead. And Price and Jackson realize that this is not a man they can negotiate with. They go to Jefferson City, the capital. They try to raise some more troops. They do raise some more troops. But then Lyon and Blair, Lyon under command, Lyon who's been promoted just from a captain to brigadier general, puts his troops, which he has raised principally from the German population of St. Louis. Now, if you study Missouri at the time, traditional leadership of Missouri rested with um, settlers who came in from Kentucky and Virginia and were largely agricultural and settled around the rivers of Missouri. Uh, but during the 1840s and 1850s, this new minority group, the Germans coming over from Germany, begin settling in St. Louis. They are more industrial, more commercial in their outlook, and they live in St. Louis. And to traditional Missourians, these Germans, this new tribe being introduced into their, well, that was probably, well, tribe maybe wasn't the right word, but, you know, like I said. Uh, this new, these people are viewed as a hostile outside threat to the traditional ideas and ways things are done in Missouri. And when Lyon begin, can't get troops raised from the traditional Missourians, he goes to these Germans. And with them, under his command, he marches on Jefferson City, chases the state government out, defeats the state militia in a battle called Boonville in mid-June, and essentially, a guy who a few weeks earlier was a captain in the United States Army has made the decision, largely on his own initiative, to overthrow a state government. I don't know how much authority captains in the Army have today, but I suspect this was a bit of an overstretch, okay? But he does this. And it appears to be successful on the surface because the state government of Missouri is chased pretty much almost all out of the state. They maintain a small foothold in the southwestern section of the state. But the federal government then installs a provisional governor by the name of Hamilton Gamble. And Missouri is back in the Union. Problem solved. Of course, as anybody who studied Missouri in the Civil War knows, the problem is not solved, because what the people of Missouri start to do is they start picking up weapons and they start waging guerrilla war against the Union authorities there, making clear that military victory has not achieved that consent of the governed victory and that the war is going to be in Missouri is going to be a miserable, miserable affair. But on the surface, it appears to have worked out well. The idea that through a conventional victory, you can achieve the political results, you can influence the governed, win them back, appears to have been proven to work here in Missouri. And so, naturally, this provides encouragement to those in Virginia who believe the exact same thing should be done. Go out and fight a battle, defeat the enemy in a battle, and after you've done that, restore a loyal governor, and you will have ended this conflict. And again, the main event, Missouri, uh, in, at the Battle of First Manassas, okay? Now, Confederates, they're eager for battle too. They think that the North, once they have lost a single battle, will come to their senses and quit. And people's contest angle. Secretary of War says, of the Confederacy's confidence says we can't be beaten. And note the language here. There is no instance of a country like ours losing, if true to themselves, meaning it all rests on the consent of the governed. If we are true to ourselves, true to the Confederate cause, we will prevail. We've got too much space, too much that we cannot be beaten by the North. And the fact that the North would even try to fight us in this situation shows that they really don't know what they're doing. But if we give them a good slap and around, That'll wake them up in a single battle, and they'll back off and let us be independent. At least that's the assumption a lot of Confederates carry into this battle. Of course, we all know that there's this thing here. 
the balance sheet. What's the old saying? The armadillo? Super determined animal, isn't it? Right? A lot of determination. Boy, the, the armadillo is true itself. When it's expressing that determination and it walks out into the highway, right, and its determination is all there, but then the 18-wheeler comes along and its determination doesn't, is, doesn't, it just, just got him in a lot of trouble, right? Now, there is somebody who tries to impress this upon the people of the South. He is the superintendent of the Louisiana Military Academy. And he says to his, he says to his local people, the North can do all these things. He concedes. You've got determination. Yes, your Secretary of War is right. You've got some determination. But we got a lot of stuff. The fact that you guys can't figure this out indicates there's something wrong with you Southerners. And therefore, a single battle will bring you to that realization, and that will end the conflict. The only people would stop and think, you'd see you must fail. Anybody knew who was Superintendent of Louisiana Military Academy then? William Tecumseh Sherman, right? He's going to come back in 1864, and he's going to visit Atlanta, right? And he's going to make clear to them, hey, this is what happens when you don't listen to me. William Tecumseh Sherman's first battle experience, the Battle of First Manassas. Okay, he's going to serve at that battle. Again, back to that Joe Manian first step of planning. Agree with the head of state on the nature of the conflict. Abraham Lincoln has a, his main military advisor, is Winfield Scott, the commanding general of the army. He's been around a long time, 75 years old, and he's lived well because he's gotten up to 300 pounds to the point where he can't ride a horse without being winched onto it, and then oftentimes the horse tries to throw them, and there's often some debate who, got the, who usually gets the worst of the exchange when Scott and the horse are trying to uh, work things out. Scott presents a plan, what he calls the Anaconda Plan. Scott believes the rebellion is much more formidable than Lincoln does. Scott is also concerned that the use of force will be counterproductive in this conflict. If you go out and fight a battle with Southerners, you will be challenging their honor. And even if you defeat them in a single battle, their honor will lead them to continue fighting on. Whereas if you rely more on what we call the modern equivalent of economic sanctions, a blockade of the South, squeeze them gently, like the anaconda does. This is why it comes known as the anaconda plan. Through economic sanctions, deny them luxuries by cutting them off from outside trade and commerce, and that will bring them back. But if you go out and fight a battle, they're going to fight back. And if you invade the South, even if you win, you'll probably be farther away from resolving the conflict than if you had not. Lincoln has a different perspective. Now, two key voices are whispering in Lincoln's ear during this time. One is Winfield Scott. The other are members of the Francis Blair family, which we've already seen Francis P. Blair Jr. out in Missouri, an advocate of, unf the belief is among these people, is that the reason the South is acting the way it does it's engaged in a huge bluff. They're bullies. But if you stand up to them, sure. Scott is exactly wrong. By not challenging them, you will encourage an image of northern weakness and lack of resolution, which will not win back their hearts and minds, but it will only further the contempt of the southern people for the federal government. Now, Blair and Scott, their advice is shaped by history specifically the history of 1832 and 1833. In those years, the United States government, the state of South Carolina, did not like the tariff on imported goods. So they inst inst instigated something called the nullification crisis and said they would not obey the federal laws on the tariffs. Now, during this crisis, Andrew Jackson rattled the saver with conspicuous zeal encouraged by newspaper editorials published by the Washington Globe, which was edited by Francis P. Blair Sr. And the crisis was resolved, and the Blairs believed the South backed down because Jackson made clear, Andrew Jackson made clear, his determination to enforce the law. And that if you take a wishy-washy 
The reason the South has gotten to this point, because whenever they've complained, we've come, you know, like with kids, right? You know your kids, right? If, you know, if your kids, you know, throw their temper tantrum in the, uh, in the store, what do you do? Buy them the candy? What thing happens the next time you go to the store? Another tantrum. But if you stand up right away, then they'll back down, and they'll learn that defiance does not pay. And if we give in to them again, we're going to be playing this game over and over. So we've got to make a strong stand.